This is Dave Bortner, Freedom Boat Service. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary in business, and we happened to run across these cassette tapes that were produced as part of the Antique Motorboating Symposium, uh, March 31st through April 2nd of 1995 at the Mariner's Museum. We thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to digitize these presentations by icons and luminaries of our hobby. We hope you enjoy listening to them and uh, join us in celebrating our 10 years in business. Thanks. On this file, you'll learn more than you ever thought you wanted to know about Chris Craft engines, particularly the Hercules-based six cylinders. From Gordon Millar, who is not only a vintage boat enthusiast, but a former president of the Society of Automotive Engineers and is eminently qualified to speak on this topic. Introduce this evening's speaker. He is Gordon Millar, a fellow chapter member of mine in Sunnyland. If I were to enumerate his credentials, he would not have time to speak to you. Um, he is a very entertaining fellow. He, his background includes uh, work at John Deere. He has a doctorate in engineering. He's worked for uh, Ethel Corporation, Hercules, and he is a past president of the Society of Automotive Engineers. Those of you who were here when Gordon spoke last will remember that he gave straight answers to hard questions. Please welcome Gordon Millar. I'm glad uh, Dean you didn't read the credentials because I didn't <laughs> have a talk plan. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Dean, for um, inviting me, and I want to uh, take a moment to share with you that and uh, to thank Martha Stewart and Tom Crew and all the people here at the uh, museum for just making this one of the most pleasant experiences uh, that a person could have. Uh, some of you that uh, aren't retired yet uh, know that um, you say retirement takes place over a period of time. Well, it really doesn't. It takes place almost instantaneously. Uh, when I retired from John Deere, for 25 years I had trouble getting our services department to do any kind of work on overtime. If I wanted them to pick up somebody at the airport, well, that's after 5 o'clock or something. I retired on a Friday, and I had some uh, stuff I had to pick up out of the office, so I came back Saturday morning at 7.30, and my parking place was painted out, and that guy <laughs> worked overtime. He worked overtime to do it, so I'll tell you, it's nice to have your it's nice to have your telephone call tel telephone ring once in a while. I'm I'm uh, really pleased to be here. Uh, we had a very well. First, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the number of women we have. There's more women now uh, joining our society, and I thought, uh, well, they're interested in boats, and this is going to be great. And. <laughs> The lady at our table, we mentioned this, she said, oh, no, that's not the reason. She says, the reason we come to these functions is that there's no line at the restroom. <laughs> Every place else. But the other, uh, the other thing that uh, did, uh, it was a little bit of concern to me. Uh, I didn't know until just a day or so ago, well, actually, when I got the, uh, the announcement that I was going to be the after-dinner speaker. I... Uh, this is not something I uh, normally do. I prefer the technical seminars and things of that nature because I, uh, I heard a story one time about uh, uh, what happened in Rome on a Sunday afternoon when they threw the Christians to the lions. And uh, they had this Christian and everybody assembled in the Colosseum and they had the Christian in there and, and they brought out this big lion and the Christian jaw jumped around, you know, and pretty soon he grabbed the lion around the neck and he whispered something in the lion's ear. And the lion went off and didn't do anything. Well, like the IRS, you know, you just can't get through one form. 
They said if, you, if the lion doesn't, you know, if you survive the lion, you can leave. But they had another lion. The second lion came out and went through this little dance, and uh, he whispered in the lion's ear, and the lion left. So the emperor was getting a little short fuse, and he brought out his biggest lion. Same thing happened. Whispered in the ear, the lion left. And so finally the emperor said, uh, you know, you don't have to tell me, but uh, what did you say to the lion? And the Christian <laughs> looked at him and said, uh, after you had dinner, you have to give a speech. <laughs> So, but you know, that does raise an issue that uh, is kind of interesting. We have the Detroit Lions. Maybe you people could have the Newport Christians and then play in a Super Bowl on a Sunday afternoon. I like to, uh, to start by saying that, that uh, I'm, I'm really not uh, an antique boat uh, authority. My, uh, Wooden boats and antique and classic boats have been my avocation. I've built several boats and I'm interested in them. I like wooden boats. And of course, the thing that is of interest to me and where I've spent my career is in the engine end of the business. But in uh, doing a little reading for this talk, it turns out that wooden boats have been around almost since the, uh, since the beginning of the written word. Probably the best record is back at the time of the Phoenicians. Uh, some 1,200 and some odd years B.C., which means that give or take a couple of hundred years, wooden boats have been around, and the wooden boat era if, uh, of at least the high-production wooden boats ends probably the middle of the 60s. So you're looking at uh, something like 2,400 years of wooden boats. But engines have only been in wooden boats for probably 60 years so that if you put that on a 24-hour clock, the period of time in which we're interested in shrinks down to 30 minutes. Of the wooden boat era, we think in terms of only, of only 30 minutes. So it's a, it's a relatively narrow slice of history. Enormously interesting, uh, highly uh, technical, uh, high degree of art and artistry and, uh, and workmanship and probably one of the most interesting things any of us could do. But to talk a little bit about engines, which is really what uh, I'm here to talk about, I, uh, you can't talk about engines without going back to the origin of the, um, of the engines. And Nicholas Otto in Germany was the, um, was the inventor of the Otto cycle engine, which we call the gasoline engine today. And that was in, a, that was in about 1876. But that engine wasn't very, uh, didn't run very well. They didn't understand when engines were first put together that you had to compress the air. I mean, the engines, they, they did that. They ran a, a piston in a cylinder, but didn't truly understand the impact of compression ratio. And so for years and years, the engines ran uh, very, very low performance because compression ratio wasn't understood. But uh, his compatriot, Rudolf Diesel, uh, he understood compression ratio, and as a result, the diesel engine was patented about 1892. And uh, the idea there with the diesel engine, of course, because you might, uh, as you might know, Champion spark plug and some of the others didn't exist in those days, and igniters were an enormous problem. So uh, Rudolf decided that, uh, that if you didn't need, you have compression ignition. That was the idea, and we're going to run the engine on powdered coal. And the story goes, uh, he put an engine together and invited all the press and everything. Engineers tend to be a little, you know, they invent something, get a little schmaltz. And they, they started this engine, and it promptly blew the cylinder head off and went right through the roof. And uh, he turned to his backers and said, our success is assured. And that, that, turned, to have, that turned out to be uh, reasonably accurate. Well, in any event, uh, it was about the turn of the century when... Uh, when the Smith brothers first began to think in terms of putting an engine in a launch. And if we can turn the lights down a little bit and uh, put together a few slides. This is not the engine that they did. The engine they put in in, um, in the early years was a SINTZ. It was a S-I-N-T-Z, and that was a two-stroke cycle engine. And this engine looks a little bit like it, but this is a Truscott of about the same era. 
and uh, that's it. Now we got to focus. But the engine was roughly the same size, and you know, this is a four-stroke, and that was a two-stroke. This was really what some of the early the early boats uh, looked like. It was uh, not long after that that uh, some other engines were designed. This is a Roberts engine. And you'll notice that, uh, again, the real problem with these engines happens to be these are the spark plugs. And spark plugs were basically homemade and went down in. And, uh, and incidentally, this engine has the proper threads here. So when the, when the owners of this engine run it for demonstration purposes, they take these igniters out, which are very, uh, uh, very difficult to operate and uh, to keep operating, and put in re regular spark plugs, which, of course, dramatically improves the uh, performance of the engine. These little petcocks here are the priming system. You fill each one with, uh, with fuel, open the uh, petcock, let the fuel in, close the petcock, crank the engine, and, uh, and allegedly the engine will go. This system here is a, this is a two-stroke engine, or at least I think it is. I, I took a careful look at it. Uh, I saw this uh, engine at Mount Dora, and uh, the, the ports are way down at the bottom of the cylinders, and, and the guy that had it really didn't know. So uh, I can only assume it's a two-stroke, and that's probably, probably true. The, uh, this is a metered oil system. Now, mind you, this is probably about uh, all the early, the early 1900s, maybe 1905, 1907, something like that. And we think in our outboard motors that metering, metered oil is uh, something that is new, and obviously the metered oil system existed a long time before that. Now, it was World War I that probably it brought the engine um, to the forefront. It turned out that we needed uh, trucks and cars. Uh, horses had been the uh, predominant means of transportation for the military, but it was the, it was the flying part uh, the, to build airplanes for surveillance, for uh, dogfighting, and of course, uh, uh, all kinds of aggressive warfare. And it was uh, during World War I that the, some very interesting engines were designed. This is the OX-5, designed by Curtis. It's a uh, V8 engine. And it, it uh, sort of set the standard for uh, engines of the day. The, uh, you'll notice the overhead uh, has no rocker covers. And uh, this is a concentric push rod, and all the valves and valve springs are in the open air. Designers in those days apparently wanted to make sure everything worked. It's like the light inside the refrigerator door. You put them under a rocker cover, you really wonder if they're working or not. And the intake was down here, which, uh, of course, in the OX-5, which you see in Miss Belle Isle, when it was converted to a marine engine, all that had to be put up in the V, and uh, you can go out and see that engine. I have a picture of it here. But the OX-5 really sort of started the trend towards high-performance, liquid-cooled engines, easily convertible to marine use. Now, my father flew uh, aircraft. The Jenny was powered with the OX-5. And uh, uh, they, uh, before they took off, they lubricated the overhead with an oil can. Now, that wasn't uh, so bad in itself. But as you know, in World War I, uh, the lubricant was castor oil. And of course, some of it would come off, and they'd breathe it. And he said he never could fly more than an hour. Uh, I don't know what the guys I don't, I don't know what the guys in Europe did. Now, uh, this is a marine version of the OX-5. And someplace here, uh, it was. Uh, 90 horsepower, 1400 RPM, 90 degree V, and uh, a relatively straightforward engine. The um, question that is almost always asked is, uh, what happened to the OX1, the OX2, the OX3, OX4? Well, if you read the history of, of the Curtis engines, they were, not, uh, they were not too good. In fact, the OX5 wasn't all that great uh, in the beginning. And finally, uh, they made it reasonably acceptable. So then they went on to the old OX6S. The OX6S was supposed to be more powerful and uh, work better and do things that the OX5 couldn't do. And the OX6 wasn't any good. 
so that it was sort of a lottery, I suppose. The OX-5 survived. Some 10,000 of those engines were made. Some were made in Europe. And, uh, and it was a fairly respectable engine. But uh, flyers that flew the OX-5 in World War I or up into the 20s wear a little OX-5 pin. And it's, I suppose it's like the Caterpillar Club. Because if you flew an OX-5 engine, you had to be a real pilot. Certainly had to know about landings, particularly off airports. But uh, the, the, next, uh, the next major move into, uh, into really interesting marine engines was the conversion of the Liberty. Now, the Liberty was, in fact, a, uh, a late World War I uh, aircraft engine. And uh, uh, it was designed by, by Colonel Vincent, J.C. Vincent, and a man named Hall, uh, of Hall Scott. Uh, Vincent was born in, uh, was born in Iowa in, uh, in 1880, joined Packard about 1910, was president of the Society of Automotive Engineers in 1920. 20,458 of these engines were built, 1,650 cubic inches, 450 horsepower, 1,800 RPM, and an unusual 45-degree V. Now, you ask yourself, why in the world would you build a 12-cylinder engine with a 45-degree V? Now, let me mention why the V is important in, uh, in a V engine. Well, it has, to, it has to have a V to be a V engine. That's the first issue, I suppose. <laughs> but... Uh, the angle of the V. Now, the cycle of a four-stroke engine takes 720 degrees. So if you have a single-cylinder engine, it fires every 720 degrees. Two-cylinder engine fires every 360 degrees. And a 12-cylinder uh, engine will fire every 60 degrees. So to simplify the manufacture of the, of the, crank, uh, the crankshaft, take my word for it, I'm not going to go through the geometry of it, but if you have a 60-degree V, you can end up with a relatively simple crankshaft. 45 degree V, and you build yourself a lot of trouble. You have to have 12 separate individual throws in order to get the engine to fire evenly. But the thinking behind it, because it was an aircraft, they wanted it to get as narrow, the frontal area, as small as possible, so they went to an enormous amount of trouble and built a very complicated crankshaft in order to have a 45 degree V. Now that's not the worst of the story. The worst of the story is not so many years ago, Caterpillar thought that was a good idea and built a, a, uh, a V8 with a 15 degree V. I don't think that engine, I don't see any of them around. But uh, the, Liberty, the Liberty did set the standard for racing and you can see uh, this was uh, from one of the the Packard ads, I don't know, that's uh, maybe Miss America 1, or I don't know which boat it is, but you can clearly see the Liberty engines, and they had a crew to run those engines in those days. And, uh, and then uh, Packard, Packard and Chris Craft had a love affair in the 20s with big engines. And uh, uh, Colonel Vincent, uh, he's, uh, again, he was a self-educated engineer, but he was very, very bright, and he was uh, also a pilot, and he uh, was an exceptionally fine engine designer. So, the, uh, so Packard used their expertise in engines in, in all their advertising. And uh, here it shows again at the bottom. I don't think that's in focus. Um, but the Packard Chris Craft, and it had, uh, uh, they all had Packard engines, which in those days, in the early years, were the uh, liberties converted to marine use. Now, for all their expertise, Packard uh, did, not did not let that information or did not use that information to carry over into their automobiles. Here is, uh, this incidentally is an original, a, a, uh, a slide of an original piece of literature that I got from uh, from a man named Gene Vincent, who Dean Guy knows quite well. He's a neighbor, lives at Mount Dora. Dean is the son of, uh, of Colonel Vincent, J.G. Vincent. And I uh, worked with, uh, with Gene at the Ethel Corporation, 1946 through about 1952. And I never knew at that time that he was the son of, uh, of Colonel Vincent. But Gene went through his archives and he, some of this material here. Uh, this, for example, has never, uh, never reached the uh, uh, the press apparently, 
and uh, a lot of his original, original material. And Gene was very, uh, to say, why in the world would you paint an engine white? Well, uh, well, first of all, let me tell, uh, mention that this engine is nothing at all, has none of the characteristics that the Liberty, that the Packard racing engines, that the uh, Packard marine engines had. First of all, this is an L-head engine. It's a side valve engine. It's a relatively pedestrian design, but probably well, well manufactured. But none of the, the expertise, none of the four valve configuration, none of the overhead cams at the that the Liberty had and things of that nature ever showed up in the Packard automobile. It was just as if there were two different companies. And so you say, why did you paint the engines white? Well, I can tell you why they painted them white. Um, as an engine designer and manufacturer of engines, people have always have asked and say, what is, what's your biggest problem? What, what gave you the most headaches in the design and manufacture of engines? They, they thought, well, you know, pistons wouldn't work or oil control or too much fuel consumption. That, that wasn't it at all, at all. It was oil leaks. Now let me tell you about oil. Oil is insidious. Oil has a mind of its own. It, 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 you, can, you can run an engine all day, take it off the stand, ship it to the customer, and the first drop of oil will go on a customer's floor. If you remember in the 30s, those of you that are old enough in the early 40s, when you went into a showroom uh, for automobiles, underneath each car was a nice stainless steel pan. That was to catch the oil. So I suspect what Colonel Vincent did, he painted it white, and he says, by God, we can see the oil when it comes out. And that's not a bad idea. In production, what we did, we used ultraviolet light. But I'll tell you this, that, uh, you know, there's a lot of lawsuits now and things of that nature about silicone implants and things of that nature. But that's the same material, believe it or not, that we use to seal up engines. And it just came about 10 years late to make my life a lot brighter. But today, the engine's in production. I mean, not the, the you know, well. <laughs> all right, what were we talking about? Well, they both worked all right, I guess. Eh? But uh, now, to, now in production today, a thin film of, uh, of silicone on all the joints and, and the engines no longer leak. I don't know about the rest of them. There's, some, I guess, some other leaks that are giving them trouble. We, well, let's move on to a different subject here. And, uh, and here again are our Packard-powered liberties, and uh, this is all advertising. But uh, some, that, that did not have a liberty. That had one of the early Packard Gold Cup engines. And now here, you know, it's interesting. That engineers work very diligently do things uh, honorably. And we have to live within the, in the confines of Mother Nature. Then along come the advertising guys, and they say, you know, let's have something, sort of, some, something that's really dramatic. Well, you know, what's dramatic? Take the car and drive it from Los Angeles to New York. That'd be dramatic. No. They get Gene Sarenson out there, and they have that car come from behind the building. And the instant he saw the car, he drove a golf ball. And then the question was, which got to the other end first, the golf ball or the Packard? Well, I suppose that was all right, but you realize he only put energy into it with the head of the club. From there on, the golf ball was on a coast. But the Packard, if they had, if they had really done the test right, the Packard should have right then and there cut the engine off, and a golf ball would have beat the Packard hands down. But unfortunately, <laughs> that isn't what happened. The guy kept his foot on the throttle, beat the golf ball the other end, and that's why you should buy a Packard. And uh, that, that went on, and some of those things, you know, engineering is supposed to be an honorable profession, and except for certain little details, turns out that's probably true. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, about the Liberty, because it is a very unusual engine. And now, this is a beautifully restored uh, Liberty in a 33-foot garwood called Red Arrow, it was in uh, Mount Dora last week, and uh, it's owned by Chuck Schwager of Salem, New Hampshire, and uh, it, it won Best of Show, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful restoration. But there's some really interesting things about it. First of all, it's an overhead cam engine, and it is driven by a tower shaft, meaning that there's a shaft that goes from here down into the bottom, and it goes around, and it's got a little gear, and it, it runs these. But 
even having done that, I don't know what, why the early guys didn't like rocker covers, but they didn't. And as a result, you can see the valve springs are all exposed. And they could have put a nice cover over that, but I guess maybe it, it wasn't really time to put a cover on it. But the other thing that's interesting is that even as an aircraft engine, it had no magnetos. And today, all the general aviation engines run with magnetos, but the Liberty ran with a coil and ignition system, which meant they had to have a battery. Uh, the thing they didn't have was a starting motor. So even though the Liberty of World War I had a battery in the airplane and ignition to run the engine, it had no, uh, no starting motor, and I'm not so sure it had a generator. I didn't, uh, I've looked at some pictures of early Liberties in uh, aircraft uh, installations. In fact, I had an airplane one time years ago, had a battery, and we just got so many starts and ran it, and, but no generator. So I, they may have had a generator, I would hope they did, but in any event, it was a, it was a ignition breaker, uh, a breaker type ignition system, which was unusual for that type of engine. And here are some other pictures of this, uh, this really interesting engine. Again, you can see that here you can very clearly see the, uh, the valves, exposed valves. And inside of, inside, of, inside of these little housings are the actual cam and the rockers. And then there's a little pivot arm that comes out through some seals and pushes, pushes on the valves. And uh, here I think we have something even a little clearer. And here you can see it even more clearer where inside, here's the camshaft, here inside are the, are the rockers, and then this little arm, there's a little, little pivot arm here, and that pivot arm goes out and pushes the valve up and down, which is, uh, which is operated by a spring, and of course this one on the other side. So it was a very sophisticated design for its time, and the only thing is if they'd put rocker covers on, why it would have, uh, you would have had a very modern engine. Um, here is a starting motor, and obviously it drives into the auxiliary case, which was not uh, on the aircraft. So I don't know the history of how this came to be, but uh, obviously it was a starting motor. This is the drive. And again, you can very clearly see here the, uh, the, the, uh, the rockers or the, the rocker arms are in here. The little, little arm goes across, and here is the valve actuator, and the valve springs are, are in the air. Now, in the early days of engines, why no one knew that uh, <clears throat> valves uh, in the guides were never lubricated. You would run uh, steel against bronze or steel against cast iron, and uh, uh, the clearances were just, just set. No one had thought at the time that we could build a valve and a guide that we could lubricate without sucking all the oil in the engine and uh, having an engine that was an oil hog. Uh, later on, we... Uh, we learned that we, were, we could seal that system. Today, all overhead uh, valve engines, in fact, side valve engines, all have lubricated guides, and they work, uh, work quite well. Now, this is uh, one of the early Packards that, uh, this one was in, uh, oh, I forget the name of the boat, but in any event, it was one that was at the, at, uh, Mount Dora. It's probably a later version of the 1M621, which was a, a big six-cylinder engine that Packard built. The engine was designed uh, in roughly uh, uh, 1923. It grew in horsepower from 250 till it uh, was taken out of production in 1938 at roughly 700 horsepower. So here we can uh, take a look. This is an incidentally is a very beautifully restored engine. Again, overhead, uh, in this case, uh, uh, they do have a cover on it, and they uh, began to go to valve covers in, uh, with those engines. Uh, Chris Craft also, this was the love affair of Chris Craft with Packard uh, during the 20s. They also had a few other engines that Chris Craft used in those days, and this is uh, Scripps. I understand the owner of the Scripps, uh, <laughs> the, this Pete, uh, Pete Hankel now owns... Uh, uh, the Scripps Company in Detroit, and uh, this was one of the marine engines, one of the few that, that Chris Craft used. They also used uh, Kermath engines uh, on up uh, probably into the 30s, and there are some of those that, uh, uh, there's an engine that the uh, original engine, that picture was sent to me by uh, uh, the museum to use tonight, but unfortunately there was no real data with it, I, so I can't tell you uh, 
tell you what it is, but it is a, it says on the top it is a Kermath engine and obviously used by Chris Craft for a while. And there are some of those restored and they still are around and make a very respectable engine. The, um, I wonder what kind of batteries those are in there. I didn't, didn't notice that before. Looks to me like he snuck 12 volts in. Right? Um, I'd like to just spend a minute now, before we go on to the next series of slides, to, uh, to talk a little bit about engine design. Now, um, before we talk about engine design, I, I'd like to make it clear I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not preaching about, about engines or, or one thing or another. Uh, but a lot of people think that everything you design about an engine, that then an engine can be anything. Uh, why is it that big engines run slower than small engines? Uh, why is it that it takes uh, an 825 cubic inch engine of a five inch bore and a six inch stroke to produce 250 horsepower when you can take a little Japanese four cylinder Toyota and it produces 250 horsepower? What, what, are, the, what are the limitations? What, what, the engine, what the, is the framework within which uh, design engineers operate. Uh, you don't have a, a great deal of freedom. Now, starting about uh, uh, the turn of the century, we really didn't understand the impact of compression ratio. So the kind of variables that you see, one of the reasons that engines that the liberty of, of World, War, uh, World War I produced 400 horsepower, and the Allison which was nothing really very similar engine. And we got the Allison up to 1,700 horsepower. So, so really, what, what happened in that period of time? Well, let's take a brief, uh, let's put the lights down again, take a look at some of the relationships that uh, create these, uh, the framework in which we live. Now, if we can be very careful with the focus, because these are not these, uh, um, I'm playing around with a new computer, and unfortunately, uh, I, I'm supposed to have a color printer, but I uh, got a printer port, and it was made in China, and it didn't work. So I, my color, my $1,200 color printer is useless. But in any event, if you start at a compression ratio of four, and this is about where we were in World War II, and we go to five, six, seven, and up in this uh, 10 to 10 and a half, is about where we ended up in the middle 50s on the high performance automobile engines. Uh, the Oldsmobile Rocket was a 10.5 to 1 compression ratio engine. And that's a 40% improvement in horsepower just on the basis of compression ratio alone. To say nothing about breathing, to say nothing about our ability to understand metals, to say nothing about uh, uh, the design configuration of the engine, just compression ratio alone can get us from, not from World War one to World War II, the very same engine framework can produce 40% more horsepower. Now that doesn't come without a penalty, unfortunately. That as you go up in horsepower and you say, well, how come these guys here in World War I didn't know about this? After all, we had a bunch of scientists and a bunch of engineers. The trouble was the, the fuel, we didn't understand in those days um, the limitation of octane number. In fact, the word octane number did, wasn't invented until 1922. So World War I went through and they, uh, without any concept of octane number. And as a result, they knew that certain kinds of straight run gasoline, no formulation to it, you just took a barrel of crude, distilled out the gasoline, put it in the engine. There was no, no refinery process to it. And uh, uh, it was probably about 55 or 60 octane number. And with just, if you, if you ran the compression ratio up, the engine self-destructed. So that was the limitation in World War I. Then in the early 20s, Ricardo and uh, Kettering and Midgley uh, began to study the problem until right in the United States in Dayton, Ohio in 1922, uh, Thomas Midgley discovered uh, the reason why this happened and, uh, and additives that could be added to raise the octane number uh, began to look at how we can reformulate the gasoline in the long chain, uh, straight chain uh, 
molecules were very poor in octane number and the short branch chain molecules that resisted the attack of oxygen, why they were high in octane number and the, 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 the ball game started. So that, uh, that was one of the limitations and of course uh, this shows what happens if you go up in compression ratio, in this case from, this is from a different series of data and I didn't have time really to redo it, but if you get up here, octane number jumps up enormously and that was the limitation in uh, engine design in the 20s. Now, uh, without being critical of our government, um, uh, though listening to Rush Limbaugh, you think maybe <laughs> you probably ought to be a little more critical than we are, the, um, the octane number that we, we see on the pump today is, prob is meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. It is a, it is a government number. Uh, when, when octane number was first, uh, the measurement of octane number first uh, uh, originated, we ended up basically with three different measurements. We had what was called the motor method, which is a very severe method. It gives a lower number. And then we had the research method, which, uh, which acknowledged that engines aren't always as severe, and so as a result, that was a high number, higher, and the difference between the two was called octane number jump. In other words, if you had an 85 motor and a 95 uh, research, you had a 10 number octane number jump or 10 numbers of, of sensitivity. And uh, then on the side, because we couldn't go above 100, then we ended up with, a, uh, with another number for aviation fuels, which is of no consequence to, to us here. And uh, we ended up with these three measurements of, of octane number. Well, the government here, when the first number first became, uh, when they first wanted to put a number on the pump, they said, what should we do? Uh, what kind of a number should we put on a pump? Well, I had a bunch of guys on one side said we ought to put the motor method on the pump. A bunch of guys on the other side wanted to put the research. The sales guys wanted to put the research. That was a bigger number. Uh, engineers wanted to put the lower number. And that debate went on for about a year, and the government said, look, it's just like they had an arbitrator, just like the baseball strike. You're not going to do it. We'll just average the numbers. So the number on the pump is nothing at all. It's nothing at all. It tells you very little about the gasoline that you either have to know the motor method, which is what affects marine engines, or you have to know the research me method uh, number with, uh, with how much octane number jump or sensitivity. So it's, uh, I, I heard some discussion today. Somebody said, well, we're going to use 90 octane number. You don't know that that's a 90 octane number. Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. If it's very low sensitivity fuel, it's very good. Very high sensitivity, high sensitivity fuel won't work in your engines. And all the people have to do that sell the gasoline is meet that average number. The spread can be as much as 10 octane number units. And so we have to be extremely careful in just accepting those numbers as uh, meaningful in the engines that we own and run. Now, um, to show you how, what happened in the years, this is the uh, model year 1900. We had a compression ratio of about four. And these data represent uh, the best I could find uh, um, average of, of marine engine compression ratios. And they went up through the 20s and the, and the 40s and the 50s and up through the end of the, of the wooden boat era at about eight and a half. And you'll find that the Ks and the Ms and, the, and the, uh, some of the other engines are, operate in about that range. And the, and the fuel that we have today, fortunately, um, most of the pump fuel will satisfy this octane number requirement and in spite of the fact that it's a phony number, uh, take it on faith that the difference is uh, that it's, it's probably, uh, you'll have very little trouble with the uh, engines that we run. Now, the, uh, the next limitation in engine design, oh, no, <laughs> let me get into another subject. I had forgotten this slide was in there. Um, we all talk about uh, how marine engines, uh, you listen to all the hype today and, and about how our marine engines were designed to run on leaded fuel and now we've taken the lead out of the fuel and we got to put mouse milk in and stuff, all that garbage. And uh, it turns out that, was, that isn't true. The engines were not designed to run on leaded fuel. They were designed to run on unleaded fuel. Marine engine, marine fuel delivered at the marina up until the middle 50s was not only unleaded, it was a straight run gasoline. And all the engines that we talk about in the wooden boat era, until you get to the 283 and the 350 
and maybe the tail end of the M's and W's of Hercules were all designed to run on unleaded fuel. So if you, if you were originally designed to run on unleaded fuel, and then we have tortured these engines for years by making them run on leaded fuel, now the same guys that didn't want to put fuel lead in don't want us to take it out. It's just a, a bunch of baloney. And here you see that blue sun was one of the fuels right here that said they had no, no tetraethyl lead. Amico had no tetraethyl lead all through the, up through World War II. There were just uh, all kinds of fuels that had no lead. And uh, as long as your engine is healthy, as long as, uh, uh, as, long as you have uh, the valve interference angles and the rotators and the hard face valves and the hard face seats and, and the short valve guides, all of which are in the engines that you own and operate today, you don't have to worry about any additive. All you're doing is putting money in the pockets of people that are selling nothing more than uh, the mineral oil with a little coloring and some Betty Crocker stuff and don't waste your money. So we can move on now, where I wanted to be before, because it's, uh, if, if octane number was a limitation, then why don't we just speed the engine up? Horsepower is a linear output of engine speed. So why not just say, instead of running 2,000 RPM, run 3,000, 4,000, why not run 15,000 RPM? Forget the noise and things like that. Just, just why not make horsepower that way? Well, the reason you can't do that is a fundamental of nature. And that is that after you get past a certain point, and this is wear, wear goes up with speed up to a point, and then it goes out of sight. Now, that point is roughly 3,000 average feet per minute in, a, in, a, uh, in an engine. And uh, if you look at the, uh, well, take, a, take uh, the Chris Craft uh, A70 with a six inch stroke, and uh, at 3,000 RPM, that's 3,000 average feet per minute. Chris Craft rated that engine somewhat lower. The early ones were only 2,000, and then they went to 2,500. And so the, the engines are designed to be somewhat on the safe side of 2,500 average feet per minute. And then you have a 500 RPM, a 500, uh, uh, 500 uh, feet per minute margin. And you say, well, why do that? Why not run them at 3,000? Well, so you're at the other side of the fence, and from an engine designer's point of view, you know, you take an engine, design it for 2,000 RPM, put it in the field, and the first guy that gets it wants to run at 2,500, wants to run at 3,000. Nobody is satisfied with what the factory does. They always know better. They always know the engine will run faster. They always know they can make more horsepower and burn less fuel. That's, that's just automatic. That's, that's the re result you get when you put something in the, in the field. So there is that margin that comes from the factory. The racing guys who are pretty sophisticated, like the NASCAR guys and so forth, they run right here. They, they, they run right at that point, not much above it. Because uh, if you can get through 500 miles here, but you can't make 300 here, you have, to, you have to run 500 miles to win the race. So you look at those NASCAR engines, the 350 cubic inch Chevys at 750 horsepower, and that's where they're running, right at the ragged edge of scuff. Now, the, um, this translates into, uh, into engine stroke as a uh, uh, RPM, safe RPM at 2,500 average feet per minute. If you have a five and a half inch uh, stroke, you can run 2,800. If you have a four inch stroke, you can run almost 4,000. And so our engines, which are right in this range, can run safely, probably the M's and the, and the K's and so forth. You don't have any trouble. You're not gonna hurt your engine if you accidentally go to 5,000. The engine won't breathe all that well, so your maximum power is gonna be more down here. But the engines are very, very safely designed to run in that area. So engine design is not a, a totally free uh, uh, exercise. You have to work within limitations, limitations of metallurgy, the limitations of lubricants, the limitations of the fuel, the octane number, the compression ratio. And of course, the next question is, if that's true, why don't, why don't all engines look exactly alike? Why, why do we have different engines? Well, we have different engines because the mission is different. But if you look at the automobile industry and you look at the engines today that are coming out of Japan, out of Detroit, out of uh, 
uh, out of Tennessee, out of Europe, you'll find they are gravitating towards a one design. Most of them are in the two to four liter class. Most of them have three, three inch or the, in the three inch bore, three inch stroke range. Most of them run 4,000 to 5,000 RPM. Somebody said earlier today, that's what, uh, that's what makes an automobile engine. And that's true. Not necessarily a good marine engine. Oops. All right. Let's see what else we got here. No, we don't have any. Um, you, you, you don't have to put the lights on. The, um, that sort of sets the stage for the grand experiment that Chris Craft went through in the late 20s of designing their own engine. Uh, if there's anything that characterizes uh, Chris Craft from all the other boat companies was that they took their cue from the automobile industry and decided that if they were going to be successful, they jolly well had to be in the engine business. And uh, as a result, they, they designed uh, the A70, put it in production, and here is the first look. You can, this, incidentally, is nothing more than a repro of the big picture, which is out here in one of these halls. But uh, uh, that's Jay Smith in the center. This is the uh, uh, production shop where the, the A70, uh, originally the A70, was assembled. The crankcase is all aluminum. The, uh, the Siamese, the, 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 pair, the pair of cylinders are cast iron. The engine is, uh, is, a, is a great historical experiment, but given the fact that uh, Jay and, and a lot of the people in Chris Craft had obviously been exposed to the Packard uh, engines, it is really a major surprise that this engine came out the original and they wanted reliability. But there could be absolutely very, there can be very little effect from having two of the, because the valves are right in here, exhaust valves, inlet valves. And, uh, and so the two spark plugs next to each other make for a, at least uh, an unusual design. And uh, here is the engine again. Uh, the, you can see all the manifolds are on the inside between the Vs. There's no manifolds. It makes, a nice, it makes a nice compact engine, that you can say for it. But in those days, those boats had plenty of room. Uh, again, just a question. And the inlet, of course, relatively small. Later engines looked a lot better. And this is the, uh, uh, this is still the, uh, this is, this is 250, this is still probably the, the A70. And then they, they went up and made uh, an A120, and uh, then they went up and made one even a little more powerful. I think this is an A120A. And uh, all told, they built from uh, 1928 until they ceased production in 1941, some 615 engines. And uh, some of those, of course, are still running. Some of you uh, may own the engine. And uh, if you do, take good care of it. It's a very precious uh, commodity and uh, represents a period in time when Chris Crabb realized that they had to be in the engine business to be successful. Now, beyond that, then, uh, Chris Crabb decided in the middle 30s that uh, they obviously uh, whether the A70-120 uh, cooled them on designing their own engines or whatever happened, I, I have no way to know, of course, what happened. But they did become involved with Hercules, and those are the engines that most of us are familiar with. And they bought 600,000 shares of Hercules stock, and starting in the middle, middle 30s up until uh, probably the late 50s, uh, uh, I guess that would be about the end of it, they, they had a whole series of, uh, of engines built on the Hercules block. And they started out with a small one. I don't even know if it's an A or a B, one of the small engines. And then uh, here is uh, a K, a six-cylinder K. That was built on a Hercules block. And then they got enamored with carburation. Um, well, here's a three-cylinder. Uh, that's a six-cylinder with, uh, that's again a K probably a, a KBL, but uh, here's another the triple carburetor engine, and uh, yet again another view of, uh, of engines with multiple carburetors. Multiple carburetors are, are an advantage if your engine doesn't breathe well. 
But you have to realize that just adding carburetors uh, uh, without any basic understanding of whether or not uh, your engine needs the carburetor doesn't help matters. I, I, the, the horsepower ratings of these between the single carburetor, the two, two carburetor, and the three carburetor would lead me to believe that, uh, that they, somebody was a pretty good carburetor so. <laughs> Um One thing though that, uh, that made the engine successful, all the Hercules engines except for the W, is the pump drive. And the pump drive is, uh, uh, if you look at some of the later engines, and I'll show you a, a couple of others, the W did not do that. The W drove off the back of the generator. And the, uh, the gray Phantoms drove off the back of the generator. The Chrysler drove off the back of the generator. Now, of all the dumb places to drive a water pump, it's off the back of the generator. Uh, that, uh, first of all, it makes it a very unusual generator. And between the pump and the generator, the generator's probably going to fail first in those days, and you had to take the generator out, and then, of course, you lost your pump drive, and you had only one belt. If the belt broke that, uh, that uh, drove the generator, you also lost your cooling. So, uh, you know, Murphy, uh, I don't know if they called him Murphy in those days, but Murphy would have had a field day with an engine that drove off the back of the generator. And we'll see uh, here, uh, that's an M. Uh, and again, on uh, it uh, looks like a standard M, but this is one of the uh, one of the really good engines that uh, that Chris Craft built. And Chris Craft actually did build these engines. They bought the blocks from Hercules. They uh, they cooperated with the design. Some of my friends who haven't retired at Hercules uh, uh, still talk to me about these engines. They're very proud of them. If you have an M, the M, although. You might say, well, it's not quite true, but the M, in fact, is a serious redesign of the K, and uh, it is an exceptionally fine six-cylinder flathead engine, and M's will literally run forever. Now, the one thing, though, they didn't do, and we'll look at some other engines later, is that they never really put in a thermostat. And uh, I still puzzle over that because we learned years and years ago, well into uh, in the 30s, that uh, in order for an engine to operate smoothly, you had to maintain jacket, boy, jacket temperatures at least of 140 degrees. Somebody in the marine engine business was worried that their engines were, were going to get too hot. The truth matter is sometimes without the thermostat and you're up in Lake Minnetonka or Winnipesaukee or uh, up in Alaska, you won't even get the temperature off the pin. And so for whatever the reason, they decided not to put thermostats. A few engines were designed with thermostat. Today, retrofit thermostats are available. I have them on my engines and use them all the time. And uh, you would just be surprised at how smooth the engines operate once, once you stabilize the temperatures. Now, this is, uh, this is a, gray, a gray Phantom. Um, it is, uh, a couple of things about this engine are interesting. Again, the carburetor salesman was around. Um, but the, the drive, the distributor drive, which goes down through the cylinder head and drives off the center of the camshaft, um, somebody thought that was probably a good idea. And uh, maybe at one time it was. But that is not, uh, is not a place today that we would drive, drive a distributor. But this engine has another, another flaw. And again, here you see the, uh, the drive off the back of the generator. Here it comes with a couple of universal joints, no less. I hadn't noticed those before. And you come, come to the pump, and of course this, uh, this whole business is driven, is driven by a belt that's under here and is very dependent. And uh, those of you that drove cars in the, in the 30s know that you always carry an extra fan belt. Uh, fan belts today are relatively trouble-free. But when this engine was designed, that was not the case. And uh, it, it's a good engine. The, the gray uh, built on the Continental, uh, Continental block, uh, most, of the, most of the standard grays were pa painted kind of a, of a army green or gray, gray color. The Phantoms were blue. And the Fireballs, which were, again, uh, higher compression ratio, ran on premium fuel, where they were all painted red. And there were some other engines. This is, uh, this is a 283 that we, uh, not too many months ago, took out of a, uh, a boat. We're rebuilding this engine into a, into a little different format. But again, the total absence of any, any thermostat. 
and then they have the temperature, they measure the temperature of the water on both sides. Unlike the standard Chevy, the 283 has no crossover water. And so as a result, you're really running two four cylinder engines. And in fact, to, uh, the uh, pump is a double stage pump with two separate water inlets, and you have two separate cooling systems, and, as, and uh, there's no, no crossover. Some people buy uh, uh, different manifolds that they put on. They think they're going to get a little better performance, and they forget that those have water crossovers in them, because in the, uh, in the automobile, the way the 283, first of all, the water came out the other end and uh, the water came in here in the bottom of the block and up through the block and in the head and out, but it, it, uh, it came out through the center. Here is where the distributor used to be when the, when the engine was in the car, and here it is now driving off the accessory kit that goes on to the other end of the engine. But the 283 is a very, very good engine, and uh, uh, Chris Craft then upgraded that engine to a 350, and the 350, most of them went to a uh, single, uh, manifold and the 350s for the most part showed up in cruisers. Uh, what we're doing with this engine, just to have a little fun, we're, uh, the, the, the small block Chevy was made, the most popular models are 283, 350, and the 400. Now the 400 uh, was not the, the best engine. It, uh, the, the bores got kind of large and they sort of touched each other and the cooling on it uh, of the engine is a little fussier, but it does have another 50 cubic inches. So what we're doing with uh, this engine is we, we took the block out and I had, we built up a, uh, a 400 cubic inch and bolted all the marine stuff on it and we'll uh, have a little fun with it. And uh, again, I don't, uh, I really tried to find a good uh, picture of an installation and uh, this is the best I could do on the 283. But the 283 is probably as nice a compact marine engine as you can find. Some of them have hydraulic gears, most of them have manual, and uh, if you want a good, reliable, smooth, uh, easy starting, well running engine, you can't beat the 283 or the, uh, the Chris 350. Um, that, uh, Chris Craft, well, I, there was one other. Chris Craft did use some other engines in the, in the post war period. These are a pair of Crusaders um, that uh, they used, but they were not engines that. Chris Craft built. They, uh, they used Chryslers for a little bit. But the thing that distinguished Chris Craft from all the other boat builders and why they survived was because they made sure they stayed in the engine business. Now, um, uh, my friends at Classic Boating sent me uh, an article that is not of any interest to us here tonight, but it just so happened that accidentally on the article on the right hand side, well, this was from a 1949 issue of Motor Boating Magazine, and it's Chris Craft not advertising boats, but advertising their line of engines. And uh, you can come up and look at this, but the thing that made Chris Craft successful, the reason they were, they were the most powerful corporation in the recreational boat business, not so much for the boats, which were very good in themselves, but they paid attention to the, business, the engine end of the business. Because remember, our boating experience, our, our, the era of the wooden boat, relatively short from probably the turn of the century, if you want to go back that far, to the middle 60s. Although wooden boats are still built, and you can go to, go to Wisconsin, Screblo still builds wooden boats, go on the, uh, on the East Coast, you'll find one-of-a-kind boat builders, but the production wooden boat is history. But engines aren't history. In fact, of the matter, everything that Chris Craft put in engines and all the things we have learned over the period of times in marine engines all carries forward into our plastic boats, which are the standard of the industry today. So that pretty much winds down the, the story about, about engines, about uh, uh, Chris Craft, whatever bits of information uh, some of you, I'm sure, know more about it than I do. But I'd like to just spend a minute now and, and talk about the future because the, well, I, I got a couple more slides, so don't turn the lights off yet. Um, you know, you think you're, you can't go home yet. No, this is, uh, I, I've, been, I've been programmed to talk for 50 minutes and I think, you know, boy, I'll tell you, it was a shock when the kids started, you tell them to do something, says, I'm not programmed to do that. It's a little, Pump head, I'll program you. <laughs> so, uh, 
um, <laughs> what, what, what probably will happen is that we are the, the diesel engine, the, the, the gasoline engine, and sooner or later we will basically have a one design combustion process for the very reason that we can't afford anything else. Uh, right now from a barrel of crude we may take 30% gasoline, 20% uh, diesel fuel, and uh, uh, you know at the upper end you get naphthas and boil offs and things of that nature, and the lower end you get motor oils, and we're not going to need that anymore now that we're going to synthetics, and at the very bottom you get tar. Well, to maximize the use of a barrel of crude, which is a limited resource, we're going to have to take a wide cut out of the middle of the barrel and design engines to be omnivorous. Now, of course, omnivorous, you think of tigers and lions and, you know, that eat uh, cantaloupes and rabbits without even batting an eye. Um, but the engines that we design should, in fact, be able to do just about that. Ten years from now, engines are maybe, I don't know, ten. Ten in, the, in this business is uh, probably too short a length of time, but certainly sometime. And we're going to have engines that are, are uh, omnivorous, will be able to run on virtually any fuel, they will be lightweight, high performance, quiet, and uh, if the government has its way, and I incidentally think it should in this case, they will be emissions free. And uh, with some of them really modern oils, uh, we stand the real chance that oils uh, will be put in at the factory. We will go to probably uh, filters in the three to two to three micron range, and you won't change the oil for the life of the engine. You just make up oil. But I did have a couple more slides because I'd like to, uh, a friend of mine, Keith Eicher, builds the offshore racing engines. And this is uh, not from an antique or, or classic boat, um, but this is uh, uh, what Keith does, and I thought you might be interested. Incident, uh, he builds these engines for the offshore racers where they're limited to 1,000 cubic inches total. This is 500 cubic inches will produce um, in the all-out blown version, mechanically blown, can go almost to 900 horsepower. All these, all these manifolds are double walled, and uh, it's all it's all uh, water cooled. You can almost put your hand on it, providing you're willing to get that close to it. Because it, uh, if you see this engine on the test stand at even 700 horsepower, it's it's actually awe-inspiring. You just almost, I mean. You couldn't pour a, a, a barrel of gasoline on the ground and burn it with a match faster than this engine could use it. <laughs> but, but again, you know, we worried about belts. Now look at all these little belts. And I've often mentioned to Keith, I said, do you ever fail the belts? No, never fail the belts. Well, I don't know about that. These look a little light duty to me, but... Uh, <laughs> They're all wire. They, they are almost, uh, uh, this is a little scavenge pump here. And uh, here there, there are some pumps. And down here there's something else. And all these things run on the front of the engine. And uh, uh, if you ever are in Florida and you want to, uh, to really visit one of the most interesting engine shops probably in this hemisphere, go see Keith Iker at Palm Coast. His shop, you can take your lunch, go buy a McDonald's before you go there, and when you walk in, just throw it on the floor and go pick it up and eat it because his shop is so clean. It is cleaner than the Halifax Hospital, and I can tell you that for a fact. So if you had, in fact, if you need an appendix operation, I'd be happier in Keith's, Keith's shop than I would, uh, <laughs> would in the Halifax Hospital. But now, uh, I just, huh? What's the block? I did hear you. What's the block? What's the block? The block, what he does is he buys the big block Chevy uh, bare face castings. They don't, he buys them just the way before anybody puts a tool to them. And then he makes them from that. So he really, this is really the four, what is it, the big block, 454. And uh, he makes it into a 500, a little bit on the stroke. I think he bores it out a little bit, but he does all the machining himself. But he, and then he puts his own heads on. So it's basically a big block Chevy, but it's not yet a Chevy. It's just the piece of iron that comes out of the out of the uh, out of the foundry. Now he's in Palm Coast, just north of Daytona Beach, and he's a wonderful guy. And they all you go in and uh, talk to him, and and he's got a couple of big dogs. So before you walk in, make sure he's, those dogs are under control because he has the a very low power. Well, at least low electrical power. I don't know what he has to feed them. I don't think he feeds them too much because they, if you don't feed those dogs too much, they work better. But uh, 
people have asked me uh, how, uh, as you know, I do uh, occasionally write for classic boating, and, and Jim and Norm are here, and I want to thank them for coming. But I've often wondered, how does Norm get such beautiful pictures? How does he do it? What does he do? Well, here, here's Norm stuck in, inside. We've got to focus it a little bit now. And there, there he is. And, and Jim, of course, is supervising. And that's taking pictures of the Liberty. But that position didn't quite get the picture. So we have one more. And that's a little better shot. And uh, I suspect in classic boating, one of these days, you'll see some pictures of Liberty. So you can kill the projector, bring up the lights. Thank you for being a patient audience. I've enjoyed coming here. It's been a great time. Ladies, don't take any offense. There's no waiting at the restroom. And uh, I don't even need a parking place. Thank you so much. That. Are there any more questions for Gordon before he slips away? Yes, sir, in the back. Can, uh, Francis, can you hand him the mic? Gordon, I just, Gordon, I just wanted to know about engines of the future. What did they have in mind? Uh, Two-cycle, four-cycle engines. What are the future plans for uh, both the two-cycle and the four-cycle engines? Well, um, you know that, that that's that. Of course, is a very very good question. We have struggled with the two-stroke engine for. Um, well, since the engine was invented. It is enticingly, uh, it's deceptively enticing. Um, you know, you get a power stroke every time the piston goes up. Um, all kinds of good things happen. But along with that is a penalty. And the penalty is in, in serious problems with emissions. Um, you, you have difficulty getting, even with an injected two-stroke, and getting the fuel consumption down. Um, the instant I say that uh, we won't have two-strokes in the future, why, of course, we'll probably have them. Uh, just things seem to work out that way. But if I were to design a new engine today for an automobile or a piece of heavy equipment or whatever, it would be a four-valve overhead cam um, four-stroke engine. Uh, probably, uh, you know, running uh, in the 3,000 RPM range, be uh, turbocharged or mechanically blown. That, that's, that's what's going to happen uh, to get the power out of our engines. See, engines really don't get their power from fuel. They get their power from air. If you, you can, you, if you, the way an engine works, it pumps air. It's an air pump. You can't pump any air putting fuel in. People say, well, I'm going to give my engine more fuel and I'll get more power. But that's not the, that's not the, you're asking, you, you're asking the engine the wrong question. What you really have to do is get more air. You can always get the fuel in. But the, the, the reason those on those Keith Iker engines, the reason all that, that uh, biological looking tubing and all nice and smooth, that's the, that's so that engine will pump air. And uh, the four stroke, four valve, um, short cam life, uh, short, short cam stroke engines uh, can really pump air. And particularly with a mechanical blower, which may even be, uh, in the long run, be more acceptable than, uh, than turbocharging. Um, I think that's the way engines are going to go. Yeah? The orbital engine, Gordon, does that have any application to bring you? The what? The orbital engine. Well, you know, uh, I'm going to make somebody mad, I suppose, but I can say it has no use in marine. It has no use in automobiles. It was a scam from the beginning. If you put any money in it, you ought to try to get it back. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a charlatan. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scam. The whole thing is a scam. The way that engine came about was some guys in Australia were going to build an orbital engine where the pistons ran around you know, chased each other around in a tube. And they couldn't make it work until they built an air injection pump. Well, the air injection pump was a pretty clever idea, except that's what, uh, that's what Rudolph uh, Diesel used in 1892. That's what kept the diesel engine out of vehicles up until probably about the middle 20s, until we came to solid fuel injection. 
So they came over to the United States and they talked to a lot of people, some of my friends even, at Walbro and Mercury and Chrysler, and a lot of people got all excited about uh, they were going to make a two-stroke orbital engine. Whether it was a two-stroke or four-stroke had nothing to do with it. it. What they did was they took a, it was air blast injection with fuel. But we got much better ways to do that, much better ways. And, and I, I almost uh, hate to be critical, but, you know, um, the longer the li you live, the less time you have to say what you think. And so, uh, <laughs> having said that, <laughs> get your money back. I would like to add a little story to Gordon here back in the old days. Uh, Uncle Jay was the engineer, and my father, Bernard, was the tester. Well, the first thing I learned from my dad is always take a paddle with you, even in a crisscraft. <laughs> But I, in my younger years, I learned to uh, pilot an airplane, and I'd fly from Holland over to Algonac, and Dad was retired then, and would come over and meet me at the airport. Come on, Dad, let's go for a ride. Go over, see the marsh, see the river. No, I don't want to go on that thing. He says, I know what those airplane engines are like. <laughs> so I took, kept coaxing him, coaxing him, and I opened up the cowling on the airplane engine and said, look, Dad, it's a little slim engine, six cylinders. Opposed engines. He says, oh, you mean supposed, supposed to run. <laughs> I thought what I thought you were going to say is he opened the hood and there and there was an A-70. <laughs> <laughs> and the other, yeah, here. wondering how long were Liberty engines made that required the priming with fuel. The reason I'm asking is I had an experience a couple of years ago. Somebody had bought an old surplus Coast Guard cutter that was designed to catch rum runners. And these Coast Guard cutters built by Fellows and Stewart in California were equipped with two V12 Liberty engines that had to be primed. They had basically no exhaust silencer. The exhaust went through an elbow right sideways out of the, uh, the hull. And he was bo um, keeping his boat uh, for a brief stop at the Atlantic City State Marina at a T. And they helped him to prime the engine. And he started the starboard engine first, which blew down the main way at lunchtime when all the transient yachtsmen that are flooding the marina were most likely asleep. And then this engine fired up. <laughs> I've never seen so many heads popping up out of every boat because of this unbelievable explosion that happened. How many people ended up in divorce court? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, engines have to have some fuel to run. They won't run on air, but, but they're air pumps. Okay. I just had a question on the, uh, could you comment on the truck blocks versus auto blocks? I understand that uh, the 283 was actually a truck block, but some of the other manufacturers like the AMC and the Ford engines, uh, what basically is the big difference? Uh, I, I couldn't quite quite hear it, I'm sorry. You, auto, the automotive block. Uh, the V8 the other engines, ma other manufacturers uh, yeah, the engines that were used in marine application, like yeah. the Hercules blocks, yeah. were basically truck engines. Truck engines, uh, that's true. And, and the 283, was that also a truck engine? No, well, the, the 283 might have been used in some light pickup trucks, but basically it was an automotive engine. Uh, the small block Chevy was, uh, it's such a good engine that, uh, and I, you know, I'm not a big uh, General Motors fan, but the 283 and the 350, they're a first-class piece of work, and I suspect there's a lot of pickup trucks with 283s and 350s, and I don't suspect they're any different than those that they put in the automobile. The only way you get the cost down is to build a common engine. You can't build different kinds. And so once you get a good engine, stick with it, and a 283 and a 350 are superb engines. The, the what cycle? The Miller cycle engine that Mott is using in that little millennium. Miller cycle? Yeah. Like Miller time or something? <laughs> no, I, I don't, no I, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to treat the question lightly. It's just not, not a cycle that, I'm, that I've heard before. Uh, give me another, give me a word about it. I'm not that technical. Well, you mean the, the Millar cycle? No. <laughs> 
So, w tell me where it's used. In the Mazda Millennia automobile, the 2.3 liter V6 that they take 210 horsepower out of supercharged using the, what they call a Miller cycle, which is a, a little different valve closure. Oh, all right. I had never heard it called that. What that is, is uh, it's a three valve engine. And uh, the, valve, the valves, uh, when the engine is at low speed, if this is the engine you're talking about, it only uses two valves. And then as it gets up, the, the, the third valve begins to be actuated. I'm sure that's how it is. I've got variable, variable valve timing. No question about it. That's a, that's a step in the right direction. That's clearly a step in the right direction. That, that has got to come. And uh, the time will come, maybe we won't even have camshafts, we'll just actuate the valves with solenoids electronically. And uh, then we can really begin to manage the combustion. I'd never heard it called the Miller cycle. And how come a Miller cycle comes from Japan? I mean, I'm just curious about that. <laughs> I have to call it the Yoho cycle or something. <laughs> yeah, last question. Uh, Bob, One more question, more for Cosa owners and for runabout owners. What is the impact of the new low sulfur diesel engine for diesel engines now would it be? Well, low sulfur, low sulfur, you're talking about low sulfur fuel. Um, uh, sulfur in diesel fuel does cause wear, but it also causes SO2, which is, a, uh, um, which is now considered a contaminant in the air, always has been. SO2, you know, it's rotten egg smell, it's like the polysulfides and things of that nature. And uh, when you go to the low sulfur fuel, you drastically reduce wear. And so I don't think anything bad will happen. The only thing that will happen is it will probably cost more. But everything we've tried to do in diesel engines is to get the sulfur out. And so low, low sulfur fuel is clearly the direction you want to go. No question about it. Again, thank you for being an audience. I hope, uh, I, hope I didn't hurt anybody's feelings. I didn't, I didn't mean to. Uh, as I said, the older you get, the less chance you have to do that. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Copyright 1995 by the Antique Boat Museum and the Antique and Classic Boat Society. Audio copyright 2019 Freedom Boat Service, LLC.